Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. My internet is, my internet, there's some problem with it, as we've been having from day to day. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't work well. Internet seems quite slow. I hope this is not going to be a problem f for this class. We're going to continue with our study of Krishna's Yoga Maya Potency, and we'll begin with Kirtan. So, don't go anywhere. We're going to div dig deep into the understanding of Krishna's potencies, how they work, and um, hopefully we'll get through it with a shaky internet where I think you're going to see my video freeze periodically. Hope, hopefully you'll still be able to hear me. Hare Krishna. Radha Madhava, Kunjabi Hari, Gopi Janabalava Giri Bharadhari. Hare Krishna. Krishna Badaya Krishna Prashtai Bhutale, Sri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste, Sharashati Devi, Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sanivari Prashtyatya Satani. Hari Radha Madhava 
पंजाबी हाड़ी श्री राधाधबा की जाए ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवतम की जाए शिव प्रभुपाद की जाए कौर प्रेमानंदी हरि हरि बो का पथुर कृपा सिंधु पथिता पवनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम श्रीकृष्ण चैतन प्रभु नितानंद श्रद्धत गाधर शिव सदी गौर भक्तवृंद मुका कौती वाला फंगुलंगयथे गिरी यम वंदे श्री गुरो दीनथरिना श्रीकृष्ण चैतन प्रभु नितानंद श्रद्धत गाधर शिव सदी गौर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय सो जस्ट कीप मी पोस्टेड ऑन द ब्रॉडकास्ट माई कंप्यूटर इज रनिंग ऑन वन सिलेंडर राइट नाउ आई सम इंटरनेट प्रॉब्लम ऑलवेज हैविंग इंटरनेट प्रॉब्लम हेयर इट्स द प्राइस यू पे फॉर लिविंग इन द कंट्री Anyway, if there's a problem, just let me know because on my screen I don't see any video at all, and um, if there's a problem, just say something, and hopefully I'll be able to read your messages. So far, I can see. Yeah. So let's begin reading again from where we left off. This next quote is from Third Canto, fifth chapter. Ah, but we were, didn't we read this? Maybe not. Third Canto, fifth chapter, text twenty-two. The omnipotent Lord, by his different energies, can perform anything and everything he likes. The creation of the cosmic world is done by his yoga maya energy. So. You may have heard the verse "Parasya Shaktir Vividaya Vashuyate." Krishna has various energies, and everything happens through the energy. And Prabhupada has given the example: even in this world, if someone is wealthy, then they will hire people to do their work. They may be out playing golf, and their corporation is running because they've hired people, experts. So Krishna runs his universe through his energies. So what does he do? He's out playing golf. Well, the equivalent of golf <clears throat> is playing with his friends, playing with the gopis. And as I often ask people, I say, "Well, if you were God, would you work? Would you hang around punishing people? Would you be, you know, uh, running your maintenance team of the material world? <clears throat> would you be, you know, writing code to make sure the sun is rising?" And people get it. They they get it. Then when you have that much power, you can hire people to do everything. So that's what Krishna does. But he has energies, and the energies are persons. So um, we're not so familiar with that. We don't live in a personalized universe. But if you study the various energies, uh, there's always a person who personifies it, or a person who controls it. Indra doesn't personify rain, but he controls it. But like Jamuna is the river, and Yoga Maya um, is a person in the form of Purnamasi, who, or, or, so, or uh, Subhadra, different forms, 
for different functions. So, and we read elsewhere that the word yoga maya is, is sometimes used as an umbrella term for all of Krishna's energies because um, everything is controlled by material and spiritual being controlled by that. So it, it's it's all encompassing. Yoga maya, in a sense, includes the material energy as it manifests externally. So it's it's a big. It's like a department. Yoga maya's department. In that department, there's many divisions. Mahamaya is one of them. <clears throat> Something like that. And so it has many functions. Not just, you know, we generally think of yoga maya as the energy which is used to attract the residents of Vrindavan to Krishna by hiding his identity. But we've also read other things. It also keeps the non-devotees away from Vrindavan. And it's also a creative energy. So, as as is needed, the energy will do. Okay, so now we're reading from the 310.17. I'm just checking back, make sure you can hear me. Yes. Okay, the next verse, Nadia, 310.17. So if you look on the chat, Nadia is posting, and we will read from that. The energy of the Lord, called Abhidya, is the bewildering factor of the conditioned souls. The material nature is called Abhidya, or ignorance, but to the devotees of the Lord engaged in pure devotional service, this energy becomes Bidya or pure knowledge. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. The energy of the Lord transforms from Mahamaya to Yogamaya and appears to pure devotees in a real feature. So we were, I think, talking about this in the last class on Friday. It's like, you know, what Prabhupada was saying, heating and cooling is a product of one energy, electricity. So you know, we've talked about this many, many times. It's like, we'll always be controlled by an energy. So what energy are we controlled with? Well, that depends on who we are and it depends on what we want. And so according to our desire, there'll be an energy for us. And so um, so often I've said that sometimes devotees complain about being a Maya or complain that Maya is strong and Maya is strong. Krishna certifies it actually, she's so strong. Daivyesha Gunamai, Mama Maya Duratya. Duratya means you can't transcend her, you can't overcome her. So it's true. But in other places, Prabhupada said, it's very easy to be Krishna conscious. So if Maya is insurmountable and it's easy to be Krishna conscious, so what's the difference? Well, it depends on us. And so according to our need, according to our desire, according to our inspiration, we will attract a different energy who will control us. We will be controlled either by Mahamaya or Yoga Maya. So do you have a choice? Yes, you do. So sometimes it doesn't seem like we have a choice. Maya is just illusioning us or bewildering us or so many crazy thoughts in our mind. But fortunately, Jiva Tattva is endowed with choice. So even if you have these crazy thoughts in your mind at that moment, you can pray, Krishna, please help me. And then Yoga Maya comes to the rescue. There was a show. When I was a kid, the Long Ranger. The Lone Ranger, not the Long Ranger, the Lone Ranger. And if there was trouble, he would ride in on his horse. So, Krishna, if Maya is, is bewildering me, or I'm bewildered, and I'm attracting Maya, I want to enjoy, please help me. And then Yoga Maya comes on her horse. And that now that energy, um, we're influenced by that energy. Just like if you go to the temple, or more vividly, you, this example is more vivid if you go to the Dham, when you go there, you feel there's an energy shift, and the energy shift is not in you, but you feel it inside yourself because you've now put yourself under the protection of yoga maya by being in the Dham. Of course, you could be in the Dham and be in maya. It's not impossible. 
But because you're coming to the Dham to become purified, naturally we try to avoid Maya in the Dham, and then you're receptible to that Yoga Maya energy. But the Yoga Maya energy can manifest anywhere <clears throat> through devotional service if that's what we want. So it's significant what Prabhupada said. It was on a morning walk. They were talking about being controlled by the modes of nature, and Prabhupada said, you will always be controlled. It's just a question of what energy is going to control you. So in the material world, Tamagun, Rajagun, Sattvagun, will be controlled by one of those modes or a combination of those modes, and one will tend to predominate at a particular time. And we can feel that influence pulling us in various directions, either up or down. Or we'll be controlled by yoga maya, by being fully absorbed, engaged in Krishna consciousness. So we ultimately decide what energy is going to control us by our actions, by our attitudes, by our sadhana, by our service. Okay. So we just read, the energy of the Lord transforms from maha maya to yoga maya and appears to pure devotees in her real feature. The material nature, therefore, appears to function in three phases. I think we read this. As the creative principle of the material world, as ignorance and as knowledge. So, um, material nature creates, um, there's ignorance, but knowledge also comes, as we're discussing, through the agency of yoga maya also through the agency. Another aspect of that, you say Cheta Guru reveals, it's, it's the ignorance is, Yoga Maya dispels the ignorance. As disclosed, disclosed in the previous verse, in the fourth creation, the power of knowledge is also created. The conditioned souls are not originally fools, but by the influence of the avidya function of material nature, they are made fools. And thus, they are unable to utilize knowledge in the proper channel. Well, think about this. How could you function, quote-unquote, normally in the material world, which means normal life, normal attachments, normal material activities, normal desires? How could you function normally if you weren't a fool? It would be impossible. And that's why when someone comes to Krishna consciousness and accepts it, they find it very difficult, at least initially, to function in the material world because they look at everything and they think, this is all crazy, this is foolish, this is ignorance. What's the point of all this? And so later on they make adjustment in, in utilizing everything for Krishna. But a lot of us in the beginning, we'd look at the world and we say, this is just a world of maya, nothing's important. You know, why do anything? And so that's the mood with a lot of us when we joined. We became brahmacharis and we thought, we'll do this for life. Because why do anything else? Because everyone else is foolishly working hard for temporary things. And then ultimately they get old and die. So there's no point. So it's true, like this curtain of avidya, it just, it gets pulled. And you realize that to engage in material life, you have to be foolish to one degree or another. You may have a high IQ, you may be a PhD, but on a fundamental level, you have to be in the bodily concept of life and, and be surrounded or covered by all the ignorance that goes with it. Otherwise, you couldn't, you couldn't actually engage in material activity. It wouldn't work. Sometimes people come to that realization on their own philosophers like Camus who became suicidal because he didn't have an alternative. He saw if you see the real nature of the world, you don't have Krishna consciousness, it would be very difficult to live because you would think what's the point of all this? <clears throat> Everything's going to end. No one's really happy. Uh, the body, living in a body is not the best thing in Desires are never fulfilled, and whatever you have, you want more, and you always feel empty, etc. So if you see that, that means the ignorance is being removed. But if you don't have an alternative, you, what are you left with? It's just depressing, isn't it? Yeah. And so Camus became suicidal. 
So knowledge is dangerous if you don't have the alternative alternative of Krishna consciousness. Because why would you want to even live when that veil is removed? Oh, yeah. You know, sometimes I think, you know, that if the veil is removed, we would all like take sannyas tomorrow. Like we couldn't, we couldn't function at all. I mean, imagine the illusion is completely removed. You don't identify with the body. You don't see anyone as the body. You, you clearly see things as they are. How could you function? It would be very difficult to function materially, at least outside of Krishna consciousness. You would think, why would you do anything? You realize you're not the body. Why would you do anything but the bare minimum to maintain your body? You wouldn't. So if that happens to somebody, that, that through their philosophical search or past karma of cultivating knowledge, they come to realize, break through the ignorance, it can be quite depressing if you don't have Krishna consciousness, isn't it? Yes. Sometimes I think of a, you know, I think of a man, he's getting married and he's very excited. And then he has instant enlightenment, like on the wedding day. And he, he realizes he's not the body, he realizes she's not the body, he realizes this, these people are not my family, I've lived for many lives, I'm pure spirit soul, Satchidananda. Like, he would think, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? It's true. Of course, it's not going to happen like that. But, you know, many men who stay brahmacharis, it's because they, they have that realization. They see it that way. Um, grihastas are working on seeing it that way. We're getting there. We're trying. Or through the grihasta ashram. We've come to see it that way. So, yeah. Um, let's read that last sentence again. It, it's nice. The conditioned souls are not originally fools, but by the influence of avidya, the, excuse me, the avidya function of material nature, they are made fools, and thus they are unable to utilize knowledge in the proper channel. And the other point is that if you have knowledge, then it ruins everything material, which is, of course, we're happy to become detached materially, because that helps us become Krishna conscious. But if that's not your goal of life, to be Krishna conscious, and you have knowledge, it, it doesn't serve, it doesn't, it's like there's no point of having, there's no point of being enlightened if you don't want to be. It just ruins everything. Like, I don't want to think about all these things. I'm not the body. I'm getting old. This world is bad, etc. I'm trying to enjoy it. And if I think about those other things, it just ruins everything. So, because we've come to this world to enjoy, and Krishna will facilitate that enjoyment, Krishna says, okay, if you want to enjoy this world, I'm happy to help you. But in order to help you, I have to cover you with a sufficient degree of ignorance. Because ignorance is bliss. And if I take that ignorance away, you won't be blissfully, ign ignorantly blissful. And blissfully ignorant. So what I will do for you is I will put you in the bodily, bodily identification that you will think I'm a man or you will think I'm a woman or I'm a young man or I'm an old man, a young woman, old man, a girl, a boy, a cat, a dog, whatever. You'll think that way. And then when you think that way, you'll actually be able to enjoy the body on some level, not, not, not fully. It's not going to be real enjoyment, like spiritual enjoyment, but you will get enjoyment. And that's why you'll find many, many people, if you ask, are you happy? They go, yeah, I'm happy. <clears throat> they have their beer, they have their cigarettes, they have their their music, they have their car, they have, their, you know, they have, they have what they want and they think they're happy. So Krishna, in order to facilitate their happiness, has to cover them with sufficient amount of ignorance. Otherwise, they wouldn't think those things are happy. They wouldn't experience happiness from those things. Just like 
if we said, um, Prabhu, we want you to drink some beer, you'd say, no, I don't want to drink beer. I don't want to get drunk. That would make me miserable. And it's true. It would make us miserable. But for someone in the mode of ignorance, it will make them happy because they're covered. So that's the unfortunate reality that in order to enjoy material life, you have to be a fool. That's a prerequisite. Because if you're not a fool, then you can enjoy philosophy. You can enjoy speculation, discussion, intellectualism. You know, so a lot of people, you know, you see academics. They enjoy analyzing. Um, they're, they're maybe partaking in this world more intellectually than physically. But in in any case. There has to be sufficient ignorance, the sufficient fool ignorance and foolishness. We can say are synonymous. There has to be a sufficient degree of ignorance to be engaged in material activity and be happy about it. You can be in knowledge and engage in material activity just because of conditioning, but then it really won't make you happy because you have knowledge. But um, the more ignorance, the better, because ignorance is bliss. And so you can be blissfully ignorant. And that's basically what material life is like. And you see that in politics, you know. This politician is running, and, and, and for most people, they're just thinking, well, under him, the economy was good, so I'll vote for him again. Under him, I had a good job, I'll vote for him again. So blissfully ignorant. He may be... Not really good for the country, not really good for the world, but I had a lot of money when he was in office, so I'll, re I'll, I'll, I'll vote for him again. That's how it works. Okay, let's go back and see if you're still hearing me. Okay. Looks like everything is good. We have a question. Is Mahamaya expansion Yogamaya? Yes. Balaram is function as, as eternal servant of Krishna. Yes. It's true that Lord Balaram and Tulsi Devi is under direction. Well, you see, Krishna is directing Yoga Maya. So, what Krishna wants Yoga Maya to do, I mean, Balaram's position is unique. But what, what Krishna wants Yoga Maya to do is is keep things in a way that nobody knows who he is. But the, the way it works is that Yoga Maya can, will do whatever Krishna wants her to do, will create whatever illusion Krishna wants her, or lack of illusion, or cover in any specific way it, according to the needs of the Leela and the needs of the devotees. So, you know, if Balaram needed to know Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Yoga Maya would let him. If it's better he doesn't know, Yoga Maya won't let him. Same with Tulsi, same with any devotee. But generally, Yoga Maya does not let the devotees know Krishna's position because that would neutralize the affection and make the affection official. I love you because you're God. You know, it's... People who have great power and wealth are attractive. But the Rajabhasis are not attracted to Krishna because of his wealth or his position as God. They're attracted because they're attracted. And that's the way Krishna wants it. So he 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 engages Yoga Maya in creating the the perfect environment for love to manifest and for the Leela to go on and whatever whatever is necessary for that Leela, then under the direction of Krishna or telepathically, there's a lot of telepathy between Krishna and Yoga Maya. Sometimes they plan it out and sometimes it's telepathic. <laughs> so that's a general idea. Um, and even Krishna forgets sometimes by Yoga Maya's arrangement. Even Krishna forgets, then he remembers, then he forgets. It depends on the Leela. So the answer to your question is it depends on the Leela. 
what's ever best. In that particular situation, that's what will happen. And best for what? Best for cultivation of love between Krishna and his devotees. Best for the proper execution of the leelas. So Krishna Karshani says, it seems that Krishna cannot uncover us for now because being uncovered, we would not do our life duties. Yes, it seems. But then, yeah, if Krishna uncovered us like the day we became bhaktas, we'd be like world-renowned fanatics. So we wouldn't be able to handle it, and which is why he doesn't, unco- he doesn't uncover us um, very dramatically. It's gradual, and then you can adjust. But you see, as you become uncovered, and as you mature in devotional service, you adjust so that you can, you can live in both worlds. Like we have the example of Priyavrata Maharaj. Well, he was mature in devotional service, and he didn't want to marry. He was um, happy to not be married, in fact, planning not to marry. <clears throat> but he needed to take the position of ruler of the world, and and Brahma had to come down to convince him. He didn't want to do it. And so there's a description in that story of how he did it. And it's, you know, I always ask women, I said, you know, we have a husband for you, but he doesn't want to marry. But he's a really good guy. Do you want to marry him? And they all say, no. I don't want to marry someone who doesn't want, you know, who's at heart a brahmachari. But, you know, because they're thinking, well, he will not be interested in family life. He'll not really be interested in me. Um, he, you, you don't want to do something with someone who doesn't want to do it, he, he, whether it's marriage or something else. It doesn't work. But with Priyavrata Maharaj, it, it didn't work as we might have thought, because externally... He was an amazing husband and an amazing wife because he could adjust both worlds because of maturity. And his wife and children never saw, at least externally, any kind of detachment like uh, to the point where they felt like he didn't care about them. So what you say is true. We wouldn't be able to do it. We couldn't function if immediately we we became enlightened fully in Krishna consciousness on day one. Yeah, it would be, it's hard enough, and we're hardly Krishna conscious in the beginning to function. We don't want to go to work, just want to hang out at the temple and do service. We can't see any reason to do anything. We have a family, you know, I have to go home and cook for my husband. I just want to stay at the temple and make garlands. You know, a lot of devotees have that experience in the beginning. So just imagine if you know, it's hard enough and they have a little knowledge, which is imagine if Krishna completely removed the ignorance. It would be difficult, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, not he's saying Krishna, Jesus said, be in this world, not of this world. And it takes time to adjust. From what I've seen, it takes time to adjust. I was just listening to a class this morning. It was so interesting. Uh, Brahmacharis were asking questions about grihastha life and about brahmachari life, staying brahmachari, becoming grihastha, you know. And they had a few, not complete misconceptions, but I'd say they, they needed they lacked complete understanding of what it meant, what it means to be a brahmachari, what it means to be a grihasta. And most of those questions were around the, the you could see the, the inability of those brahmacharis to understand the value of grihasta ashram or even understand how they would enter it if they had to in just the whole context, concepts of Grihastha. There's a lot of misunderstanding around it. So with that misunderstanding, you can't, you don't adjust well to the material because you, you're like afraid of the material. 
you think, you know, I'm going to get married and it's like now the universe is going to come crashing down. My spiritual life has ended and I just have to cry until I die. You know. Okay, and exa I'm exaggerating, but it's kind of how they, f you know, they're looking at that, you know, like, like marriage is like total defeat. I'll just stay a brahmachari even though unqualified, <clears throat> even though they would really do better married, I'll stay a brahmachari because that seems to be the best thing. Misunderstanding of both brahmachari and grihasta. So, how did I get on that topic? Um, yeah, so that, yeah. They weren't understanding clearly how to be in the world and not be uh, of the world, or even understanding who needs to be a brahmachari and who doesn't. So, vidya vidya chayas vedo vayam saha isopanishad. We have to master both the material and spiritual side by side. We have to understand how to exist in both worlds simultaneously. Because we don't we, we do exist in the material to some degree. Brahmacharis exist less in the material. They actually have no material duties. I mean, you know, they have material bodies, but for all intents and purposes, they're not really very much dealing with the material world. <clears throat> But in grihasa life, you're dealing with it a lot. And so then it requires some adjustment of understanding and balancing. And usually as you mature, you can do that. And usually in, in a less mature state, you don't understand how to do that or even why to do it. And you kind of feel maybe you can't do it or can't do it well. And, and therefore, if you feel or you don't understand how to do it, then you will fail. To one degree or another. Yeah. Sadhyarupa is saying if we become enlightened, we'll naturally become balanced. Um, yeah, but if, if you become, en yeah, it's true, but you wouldn't become enlightened until you're balanced. So, Hare Krishna. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's true, Sadhyarupa. You know, it sounds good. It sounds good like as an answer for a test. That's probably the right answer. But practically speaking, uh, if you're not balanced, you really couldn't become enlightened. Or at least we could say, if you're not balanced, you couldn't handle it. You, you know, it's like one time, Prabhupada, the devotee was asking, I, I forget what he was asking, something like, the question we all have, why, you know, we're struggling to be Krishna conscious and we're dealing with Maya so much. So then the question comes up, well, why doesn't Krishna just make us Krishna conscious? Why doesn't he just give us love? Why, you know, he doesn't want us battling with Maya. He doesn't want us in this world. So why not just make it easy and give us everything? And Prabhupada said, because... It, he didn't use this example, but this is the way I understood it. It's like, let's say, Satyarupa, when you were like 12 years old, <clears throat> and let's say your father was extremely rich, he says, here's a 10 core rupee, you know, for your allowance this year. So 10 core rupee, I think it's like a um, million dollars or something or more, 1.2 million or something, U.S. Is that true? Something like that. Let's just say it's at least a million dollars. You know, and he says, um, we'll just put it in the bank and you have a credit card and, you know, it's yours to do with as you like. For most 12-year-olds, that would be a problem. They wouldn't be able to handle it. But if he said, here's, here's a thousand rupees, and I want to see what you do with it, how you spend it or invest it. And if you do well, I'll give you more. So that's how Krishna does it. He gives you a little, little bit according to what you can handle. And so Prabhupada said, you wouldn't be able to handle if Krishna just gave you Krishna, like doses and doses of spirituality. You don't have a, ve your vessel would crack. That's the best way I could explain it. You know, it, it doesn't say, but if he gave us Krishna conscious, I would be Krishna conscious. It would seem that way. 
but Prabhupada's saying, if he gave you all that Krishna consciousness, your vessel's too small, he can't handle it. It would just overflow. Um, and it would just, it would be a problem for you. It would actually be, it work against you. You you would misuse it. That's the point, yeah, okay. Okay, I finally woke up. Yeah, now I know what I'm trying to say, yeah. You would misuse it. That was Prabhupada's point. Krishna can't give it to you all of a sudden. You would misuse it. So, so that assumption that when you'd be enlightened, yeah, everything would be okay. You'd be balanced. But Krishna won't give it to you until you're balanced because you won't be able to handle it because you'll get it and it'll throw you off. And the example Prabhupada gave, he said, if you as a neophyte got love of Krishna or were endowed with like tremendous mercy that distinguished you amongst the uh, Vaishnavas, you'd become proud. You wouldn't know how to handle it. So generally, he doesn't give you more than you can handle. And if you you want more Krishna consciousness or you want more service or to be better at what you're doing or produce better results, then the thought should be, okay, I have to become qualified to handle it. And then Krishna will help. Or Krishna will facilitate by giving me more or more service or more Krishna consciousness, if I can handle it. You know, so your father's looking at you, okay, I gave you a thousand and half of it you gave away, but half of it you reinvested and now you have a thousand again. Oh, very good. Let me give you 10,000. Then he gives you 10,000. Half you give away, half you invest. You made it, you're back to 10,000 or maybe now you're up to 15. Oh, very good. Let me give you one lakh. Like that. So that's interesting, right? Isn't it? Um, Christe says, but many devotees become distant from their devotional services when they get into a relationship, at least in the first years, until one readjusts. Readjusts. Got an A there. They lose a couple of years of good practice. So that that will happen if they're <clears throat> that often happens. That often happens because they're not being properly guided. Or <clears throat> either they're not being properly guided or they're madly in love. Or maybe they're just mad. Oh yeah, madly in love. That's a good one. They're madly in love. They've gone mad when they fell in love. Um, you see, one of the mistakes <clears throat> is that I was saying the I was saying on Saturday, and we gave a class on Grihasta life, and I was saying, I was saying the problem with Grihasta life today is that people are watching too many romance. People are watching too many. Bollywood, Hollywood romance movies and reading too many romance novels. So they have this whole concept that marriage is going to be like just one endless date with the most amazing man or woman you've ever met and who madly you could just stay with them and stare into their eyes for eternity. And, you know, that's the way it's portrayed in fiction. But the reality of Grihasta life, um, especially if you've been married, you know what the reality is. It's it's hard work. I was listening to something it was so funny. So um, Bhaktivedya Purnaswami was being asked. I forget what the question was. It was about you know the free. I guess the freedom you get when you're married. And he said, well. Some men want to get out of the ashram because they don't want to be under under the control of the temple commander. He said, <laughs> but when you get married, you just get a new temple commander called wife, and she's like nine times stricter and more demanding than the temple commander you had as a brahmachari, which I thought was very funny and also true. I don't know about the nine times, but, you know, um, so... We, I, I, this is just my observation. 
it seems like when people are thinking get, are getting married, they think it's like an endless date, you know, because you go on a date and it's all like new and you know, there's no responsibility. It's just like you can enjoy one another. You think the other person is so amazing. You love everything about them. And you think they're so beautiful and so smart and so witty and so this and that. And so you think you get married. It's just like that date is going to never end. That's the problem. That's where the bewilderment comes. But if you get married and you realize, okay, now we have to roll up our sleeves and do some work so that we can adjust to this in a Krishna conscious way and we can help one another be Krishna conscious, not help one another enjoy the material world, then you'll be okay in the beginning because you'll, you'll just see that we're uniting to do more service and to help one another in our sadhana. We're not uniting for one eternal date so I think that's where the problem comes. Not so easy to solve because we're raised on romance novels and romance movies, directly or indirectly. So that's, that's how we see marriage. Endless romance. It's hard work. You gotta, you gotta, you know, you go on a date, you know, take your girlfriend out to the restaurant, you know, it's not that expensive. Get married, it's expensive. And <clears throat> it's a lot of work to get that, you know, just call her up, let's go on a date. That was easy. You don't have to work much. You just spend a little money on the restaurant. But married, you know, to make you gotta work hard and you don't get so many dates anymore. You know what they say? They say husband and wife should go on dates because once they have kids they're like they don't even have time to talk. He's working all day to pay the bills. She's taking care of the kid. He comes home, she's wiped out. You know. <clears throat> it's not what you think it is. Buyer beware. <laughs> so when you have a realistic understanding of what Grihasta life is, then you enter it. It's not, it's gonna, it'll, it'll, it won't be a problem. You already know how to adjust. Uh -huh. Purification process is balancing us. The process enables us to handle the mercy. Yeah. And as so the point is, Satya Rupa, Krishna will not give you more mercy than you can handle. And you can, you know, you can pray till you're green in the face. Krishna, give me mercy, give me mercy. Whoa, give me mercy. Well, purple in the face, I guess, or red. But we say green in the face. You can pray. But unless you make your container bigger, what's he gonna where is he gonna put all the mercy? You know, you're praying for all this mercy and you get this little 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 cup and it's like Krishna's like, I can't put anything in that cup. Your cup's already full. You're praying for mercy. Open your cup up so I can put more in. And opening the cup means become qualified. How am I gonna give you mercy? Daddy, daddy, give me more money. You wasted, I gave you a thousand rupees and you wasted it. I'm not going to give you more. Get that thousand rupees back and then figure out how to get it back and then we'll talk about more. So like that. Oh, Puna Puna is back again and again and again and again. Hare Krishna. That's her nickname. One, um, Puna is one of her names, but I think she was the second daughter. It's like, oh no, a girl again. Puna, Puna. Again and again, a daughter. Marco says, if we could see everyone as spirit souls, therefore eternal devotees of Radha and Krishna, we will understand the karmis and even the asuras are only temporarily covered by the condition in their consciousness. It would be wonderful. I have to find where we left off. It would be wonderful to have equal vision with everyone. As you explained, it takes a certain degree of madness to enjoy material life because one has to think, I'm the owner, enjoyer, Prakriti, how to explain this in the case of Devas. We're considered sakama bhaktas or devotees with material desires. 
That is, how is it possible to be a devotee and at the same time have rooted materialism, different levels of devotee? That's why they're called sakama. It's not pure. You know, you know, Marco, you know well, you know the Shastra. In Bhagavatam, where is it? Third canto, devotional service and passion, devotional service in ignorance, devotional service in sattva Like you could think, how could you have devotional service in ignorance? That's a paradox. That's an oxymoron. Devotional service is transcendental. Devotional service is transcendental, but your consciousness may not be. So therefore, Krishna is describing this person's doing devotional service, the body's going through the motion, but his consciousness is in Tamagun. So it's considered devotional service and ignorance. So devotional service doesn't mean it's pure. It can be adulterated. So demigods are adulterated with kama or karma, fruitive action, desire. So we our goal is bhakti without lust, bhakti without greed, bhakti without desire, for taking a better birth to get ahead. But even in our movement, you know, I may do bhakti so I could become the temple president, and then I can control everyone, or then I can be known as the temple president, and I can walk around my apartment, I'm the temple president of Villa Vrindavan, you know, lick my toes, you know. So that may be there, and it may be very subtle, like it may be so subtle that the person who has that desire doesn't even realize that that desire is motivating him. That's what makes it even more scary. But I don't think it's difficult to understand we are conditioned souls that are taking up bhakti. So as conditioned souls taking up bhakti, there's this fragrance of conditioning that, you know, or odor, I would say, not fragrance, there's an odor of conditioning. So it's mixed with the fragrance of bhakti. Hmm. That smells really good. But what's that? I smell something. Oh, that's bhakti. It smells good. But what's that? Oh, that's your desire to be temple president because you want all the, to marry all the girls in the temple. And you can get your choice if you're temple president, right? Yeah, it doesn't smell so good. All right. And you don't even know you're thinking like that. But, and why don't we know we're thinking like that? Because we've been thinking like that for the last 10 zillion births. So it's subtle. It's just the way we are. We don't notice it. Isn't that interesting? We're so messed up. We've been messed up for so long, we don't even know we're messed up. It's like having a shirt that's white, but it's so dirty it's brown, and it's been dirty for so long, you don't even, know, you don't even remember that it was ever white. Someone says, you know that shirt's white? You're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's supposed to be white. No, it's a brown shirt. Yeah, so we've been wearing a brown shirt for so long, we don't even notice it's brown. We just think that's normal. We don't know that it was a white shirt. That's what I'm saying. We're trying to say, or did I actually say it right? Anyway, you get the point. So, um, you know, there's another way of of answering this question which is it's funny, but Prabhupada has answered it this way. How is it possible for a devotee to be at the same time rooted in material desire? You know, you could, the answer to that question would be, how is it possible that they're not? <laughs> because we're coming from the condition <laughs> platform and we're trying to become purified. So, you know, like if, if somebody isn't, that's like, well, that's amazing. This new bhakta, he's like totally pure. He has no desire. That would be the exception. But the normal thing is, yeah, we have so many desires we're trying to purify. And, you know, it it just goes to show demigods are attached to Krishna and they're attached to sense gratification. And it seems that the two uh, can't happen simultaneously, but they can. We've seen it. I've seen Because... Everybody has their nature. I've seen very, very Krishna conscious people who are very, very materially, they live a very materially nice life. They, that's their nature. They need to live like that. But they're still attached to Krishna. And philosophically, we would say, well, how is that possible? Because they should become detached. Well, there's also nature. You have to take into consider 
consideration we all have in nature. You ever see a devotee doing something? You think, why is a devotee doing something? They're so advanced. Why would they want to do that? It's their nature. That's why they do it. It's their nature. It's what their mind and body does. So, and then as they advance, the nature becomes more refined, more purified. Is that okay? It will have to be okay because we're going to the next question. And if it's not okay, you can let me know. We have a question from Nadia. We have a question all the way from Siberia. Do I have to speak loud so you can hear me? When um, <laughs> we first went to India in 75, you'd go to the post office and wait in a line to use their phone so they would, and you have to call the operator. And the phone booth was like built in 1930. The phone was built in like 1540. I mean, it was it's like a movie set. It was so funny. And then you call the operator. We're reconnecting. Oh, disconnected. We're try again. Disconnected, you know. And finally, you're not connected. And you have to scream because they can't hear you. The lines are so bad. Arriba, bravo! And it was like it was like you were yelling over the ocean so they could hear you from India to America. It was so funny. And then after about two minutes, you'd get disconnected. So... Nadia's in Siberia. We have to yell really loud so she can hear us all the way over there. Um, what are the practical steps we can make? You know, when I used to do Sankirtan, I was so funny. I like to be funny. And I always said, yeah, Temple Brahmacharya, you got to be serious. Learn your slokas and chant your rounds. You know? I go, let me out on Sankirtan. I can be funny with people. You know, somehow I like to be funny. That was half the fun of Sankirtan. I like it. It'd be funny with people. So, um, but I was trained. I did a training on how to do um, seminars, you know, like 12 hours a day for days and days. And they said, the funnier it is, the more people learn. <laughs> they call it edutainment. Educated and entertained. And <laughs> it's, I don't know if they've done, if they've done any studies, but... It's like the more you laugh, the more you learn kind of thing. That's what they taught us. Okay. It's time to be serious, all right? Stop laughing. It's time to be serious. Stop laughing. You're not going to learn anything now because you're not laughing. But no. You can also learn if you're not laughing. But if it's fun, you learn more. Did you know that? Yeah, Prabhu, I knew that because I had like 4,000 boring teachers growing up. So, yeah, and I can't remember anything I learned. I know that. Okay, what are the practical steps we can make to become more qualified to get what we want in Krishna consciousness? And is it okay to perform austerities to get something in Krishna consciousness if you don't have a selfless desire to please? Well, I, I would say become... Um, You know, it's interesting. We are told we, our bhakti should be free from the desire for anything other than the pleasure of Krishna. We shouldn't want to get anything material from it. We shouldn't want to go back to Godhead from it. We wouldn't shot it. We, so part of the answer to your question is just understanding that that's what bhakti is. That I don't want to say that's the goal of bhakti. I'd rather say understand that that's what is that's what bhakti is and if we want to do bhakti that's how we have to be so that's premise number 1 premise number 2 is what can you do to get there right so your first part of your question is um, become more qualified to get what we want in krishna consciousness we God, this I could probably do a whole seminar on this question. Where to start and where to end? Let me let me try to answer it. 
from my personal perspective, a, a lot of times, and the acharyas also pray this way, Krishna, they pray, Krishna, make me qualified. Make me qualified for pure devotional service. So sometimes prayer is the answer. How do I become more qualified? Pray to become more qualified. And what would more qualified mean? It would be being motivated only with the desire to please Guru and Krishna. So, and then, as I said, understanding that that's the goal, praying for that, constantly, always praying, Krishna, help me become more qualified to receive your mercy. And then just going through the practices of devotional service that purify you, but doing them better. So you become, okay, I want to become more qualified. Do them better. Then you become more qualified. Right? Right, you are right again. Or as my teacher said, yes or yes, good or great, true or true. Is that true or is that true? I mean, you know, this question is kind of like asking, how do I become a pure devotee? Well, then the answer is, well, just open Prabhupada's books. Every page he tells you how to do it. It's not like, not like Nadia, Mahatma Prabhu knows the secret formula that we haven't heard before about becoming qualified. He's going to tell us what it is because we need to, you know, what's your answer, Mahatma Prabhu? I'll just open any page of Prabhupada's books. There's your answer. <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to explain a little more kind of dissecting the question. Um, um, you know, what does it mean to be more qualified? It means to, to be able to use everything in Krishna's service, to, to be able to um, handle whatever Krishna gives us in terms of resources, be it money or men, it means being able to be in difficult situations and not succumb to my material desires, all these things. And so in asking the question, I would I would say back to you, or one answer, another answer is, think of all the things that will be your weak points. Like where, you know, the father wants to give you a uh, $1,000, what would be your weak point? You think, oh, if I had $1,000 and the next day I would go out and spend it on this. But he wants you to invest it or give it in charity or do something wisely with it. So what are my weak points and how I can strengthen them? That's part of it. And becoming qualified to get the mercy. Okay. you know, And if you do some austerity or go through some difficulty or you give up some attachment that's blocking your bhakti and Krishna sees that and he goes okay mercy for you 10 mercy points you wanted to do that you saw that it wasn't good you didn't do it 10 mercy points for Nadia let's give her a big hand you know it works like that you know okay you know I am lazy but this morning I got up early chanting my rounds 10 mercy points for Sanatani you know and Medha is like, well, I'm so busy, I don't have time to read. But today, Manjari says, today I'm going to read. She reads Bhagavadam for two hours. Ten mercy points for Manjari. Or whatever it is. So, you know, do something to show Krishna you deserve the mercy. Well, you know, I would just ask you, Nadia, what could you do to show Krishna that you're deserving of his mercy? And second part of the question. You know, sometimes I throw questions back because I think the best way to answer it is throw it back. I think that's a good answer. The last. What do you think you could do personally? Each of you, what do you think you could do personally to get more mercy? Question two, is it okay to perform austerities to get something in Krishna consciousness if you don't have a selfless desire to please Krishna? Depends what it is. I would need an example.
Austerity is always good. Austerity to become, get something in Krishna, what, like an ability? So the answer to your question is, if you don't have the desire, she's saying here, can I do austerities to, to achieve something or get something, some mercy or some power or to do service or some consciousness to, to make me more detached from things which are bad for me? If I don't have a selfless desire to serve Krishna, You can pray. You can pray for the selfless desire to serve Krishna. Uh, Krishna, I don't have a selfless desire, but I'm praying for it. So that's the next best thing. You're like, what do I do if I don't have a selfless desire? Pray for it. I don't think you should give up austerities uh, until you become selfless, because you might not become selfless till you're 96. Perfectly selfless. So, but. Rather, I would say, rather than looking at the goal as being perfectly selfless, I would say, look at the goal as, are you more selfless this year than last year? Will you be more selfish, selfless next year? Are you making some progress? If you're making progress, that's very good. And as I said, in between, pray, for Krishna, pray to Krishna. Please help me become more selfless. And if you're not selfless, but you're praying to be selfless, then... In a sense, it's almost the same because the intention is there. The conditioning is there making me selfish. The intention is to be selfless. And that's what Krishna says. Uh, excuse me, that's what Krishna sees. You know, it's like, let's say, Nadia, you make me a cake, and it's like the worst cake that anyone ever made. And you give it to me and you say, I really tried to make this cake the best cake anyone's ever made, but I don't know if it came out right. And I eat the cake and I I eat it and I say, thank you so much, Nadia. Um, it needs a little work, but I really appreciate your effort. So Krishna's like that. He doesn't say, take a bite and go, spit it in your face. What are you feeding me? Who do you think you are to feed me this? Krishna's not like that. Actually, Krishna's better than us because he'll eat the whole cake and go, that was amazing. That was the best cake I ever had. Even though it was the worst cake he ever had, it was the best because Nadia made it with devotion. And when you're cooking that cake, Nadi, you can think, I don't have any devotion, I'm so selfless, but I just want to please my guru, I want to please Krishna with this. And so then it's perfect. That intention, even if you don't, you're not selfless, but if you have the intention, then it's perfect. What more could you ask for than the intention? Sanatani says, how to accept Krishna's mercy even when it's very purifying? <laughs> You mean, too, it's too purifying, too much purification, too fast? I'm in the fast lane of purification. I don't know if I can take it. Um, how I would do that, or how I have done that, is it like Krishna must want me to get purified very quickly because I'm going through it. Like It's kind of like Sanatani asking the question, how do I go through something that's difficult. Um, and then my question is, do you have a choice? Can you not go through it? No, I'm go I am I don't have a choice. I'm going through it right now. How do you go through it? Hmm. Kind of like, hold on, you know, how do you go through a roller coaster ride? Hold on, hold on to the rail, basically. <laughs> how do I tolerate this roller? Just hold on to the rails. Just hold on, you know, it's kind of like, just hold on. But if if you know that this is what Krishna wants from you, if you know that, it's much easier to deal with it. Okay, Krishna wants this. There, there must be a really good reason he wants this. So I'm going through it. I'm doing it because he wants it. So if you know he wants that purification, he's arranged that, 
that is good for you a lot easier than thinking, I don't deserve this, this is too much. Why Krishna is doing this to me? What did I ever do to you, Krishna, that you would do this to me? No, you can't think like that. <laughs> I never did anything wrong. Why did all bad things happen to me? And, and, no, we have to think this is, you know, this is what Krishna wants me to go through now. And as soon as you think this is what Krishna wants me to go through, now all of a sudden it's like so easy to go through it. But if you're resisting, it's so hard. I don't deserve it. It's not right. You know, why was I, why did Krishna put me through this? You know, then that resistance makes it very difficult or impossible. Isn't it? I have a question from Krishna Karshan. So what to do? What to do with those motivated desires in KC if we are not often even aware of them? Yeah, that's the problem. We're not aware of them. How can we remove them if we often? Uh, you can listen to my. You can you can listen again to the work, the retreat we did in February. It's actually on SoundCloud. And the questions are there also, because we have questions to help you. Like questions like, okay, let's make a question out of this. What do we do with those motivated desires in Krishna consciousness we're not even aware of? Okay, the question is, what impure desires do you have that you're not aware of? It's a strange question, isn't it? Well, how do you expect me to answer if I'm not aware of it? Well, that's what I'm asking you. Maybe you can become aware. Would you like to become aware of what's motivating you or why you're doing it? And I think for many of us, no, I'm afraid to become aware. I already feel bad enough about myself. If I become aware of all these, these crazy motivations I have to show off and be number one and you know attract the opposite sex, and I don't want to admit all that. I'd rather just stay blissfully ignorant. What's that song? by Pink Floyd, comfortably numb. Yes, just be numb, it's quite comfortable. Prabhu, why don't you examine your heart? Now I'd rather stay comfortably numb. Where ignorance is bliss, it's folly to be wise. It takes some, it takes a desire to go deeper into understanding one's own consciousness, what is moving you and motivating you, but you have to. If you want to become, become pure, you have to weed out anything impure in your consciousness. So you have to become aware. How do you become aware? Ask yourself, why did I do that? What was the motive? What was the reason? What's behind it? You know, because it's true. Some people may want to take a position in ISKCON because of the prestige. And they can walk around Mayapur and everyone will go, oh, and you, you're the temple president of such and such. But yeah, yes, Prabhu, I'm the temple. Oh, obeisances. I heard about your temple. I heard it's really good. Oh, thank you. And you're eating it up like ice cream with chocolate syrup and whipped cream and cherries. Of course, you don't let anybody know that. You think being honored is delicious. But at least you have to let yourself know that. <laughs> and you think... Okay, all right, I now realize that I wanted this position to show off. Now what do I do? Well, I start, I, I, that's amazing that you could realize it. So we really have to penetrate deeply with this question, why? Why am I doing this? Why am I getting involved in this? And hopefully the answer is because I want to help ISKCON, I want to help other people, I truly want to push this movement forward. But sometimes the answer may come is because because I like to control everything and everybody that's within a hundred miles of my house. Okay, that's the actual reason I got involved. <laughs> Why did you get involved in this? Because I hate that devotee. That's the real reason, and I want to see that devotee suffer. Okay, you would think. Devotee would actually feel that way? Not really, but a little bit, maybe possibly, could be, in a neophyte stage. So we have to look at that. And sometimes it's hard to see because the first thought is, I'm a devotee, I would never feel that way. 
Oh, really? You wouldn't? All right. Not even a little bit? Little teeny, teeny little bit. You'd like, you know, you don't really like that devotee. And, and if that devotee got embarrassed on Facebook, would you feel like maybe feel like he deserves it? Yeah, maybe. Okay. But maybe your dealing with that has something to do with that. Uh, that's a good point, Virgo. I'm going to have to think about that one. If we were more transparent with ourselves, we wouldn't have to think about that one. We would know before we even engage that that's why I'm doing it. So we want to come to that position where we're self-aware. Right? Yes. So it, you know, it's it's a process of, you know, you have to have the desire to want to know what your motives are and start asking, why am I doing that? And being willing to admit, oh, I, I did it. Why did I do it? Sometimes we do things because we're afraid. You know, so much of what we do is out of fear. Why did you do that? Because I was afraid. What were you afraid of? I was afraid of this. So now you're you're getting you're getting to understand your motives and. You know, Rupa Goswami says, Anya bilashita shunyam, jnana karmada nabritam, bhakti is free of motives. Excuse me, pure bhakti, uttama bhakti is free of motives, material motives. So if pure bhakti is free of material motives, we want to be have some radar out on our motives, isn't it? Then you might say, yeah, but what if I want to do this because I'd like to? Okay, a lot of us do things because we like to. That's fine. It's our nature, naturally. Like Manjari likes to paint. She's an artist. So naturally, that's just natural. But we don't just do it because we like to. But now we do it be, and we think, okay, how can I use this in Krishna's service? Why am I doing this? I'm doing it because it's my nature, but I'm also doing it because I could use this nature to glorify Krishna. Oh. Is that why you're doing it? Well, that's why I should be doing it. Well, are you doing it so other devotees will glorify you rather than you glorify Krishna? Hmm. I have to think about that one. Hmm. You mean like if I do a painting and like, like it gets in a book and people see it and they see my name there? You mean like maybe I was thinking like maybe... I'd get some honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you thinking like that? Hmm. You know, hmm. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, okay. And I think for all of us, if we, if our motives are questioned, why did you do that? Were you thinking, you know, like somebody would recognize you or this or that, or you'd get some control or power? You think? Oh. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I think that would be the answer for most <laughs> devotees in the conditioned state. <laughs> there was a little something there other than the pure de desire to serve Krishna. You know, to impress. No, I didn't really want, you know, I didn't really want the honor of the devotee. Was there anyone you were trying to impress? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, maybe one person, actually. Yeah, yeah, I was. Actually, I was trying to impress one person. So sometimes we don't notice it because we, we don't we don't have this need to impress all of Iskon. But maybe we have a need to impress one person. That's honesty. And it's not easy for everyone to do that. I think I think I read somewhere that some people have a nature where they actually can't do it. And I hope that's not true, because we really need to do this to be Pure devotees, you have to understand what's motivating you. Because how are you going to become pure if you don't even know what motivates you? Right? Okay, good question. And I hope that answered it. Your husband says, para ananda, because we act many times in selfish motive, we have problems to act without motive. How to overcome sense. I think... Um, the last answer was the same. Would be, would answer this question also, but if pure devotional service means not being motivated by jnana and karma, then we have to think whatever we're doing. 
I have to do this to please Guru and Krishna. This is just what I have to do. This is how I have to do it. Somehow or other, I have to do it. I have to monitor my motives. And that's something you can do. Para Ananda, you can do that. You can monitor your motives. And if we want to love Krishna, then it means we want to serve without motive. That's what creates love. That's what love is. So how can we do it? Because we want love and we want to cultivate love and that's how we cultivate it. We understand it and we cultivate it because you, para ananda, are in, in control of your motives. Why you do something is in your control to one degree or another. Or it can be. It, you may feel out of control, but you can bring it into, under control. It is a national holiday in the United Kingdom, so listening to you peacefully from... Uh, that's a national holiday. Nice. We need more holidays, right? It's a holy day, a national holy day. Holy day for listening to class. How much sadhana and service I do doesn't seem enough. I get more greedy for sadhana and service. Good. The more the merrier. How do you understand how Krishna mercy manifests to you? What is it like? Um, inspiration? You'll feel inspired, you'll feel happy, you'll feel energized, you'll feel detached from everything material, you'll have lots of realizations, you'll be um, empowered to spread Krishna consciousness, you will affect other people, your whole consciousness will be aligned with Shastra. Those are some of the symptoms. And, you know, as you go higher, then bhava, that's, how do you know you got Krishna's mercy. I'm on the stage of Baba Prabhu. How do you think I got here without mercy? Come on, you know. Get real, Prabhu. You know, you don't get to Baba without mercy. Yeah. So <laughs> the short answer to that question is because you're advancing in Krishna consciousness. That's how you know. You couldn't advance without mercy. And the more signs of advancement, the more mercy. Christe says, I am sometimes doubtful of taking certain important services because I fear Maya might jump at me and blind me with ignorance, making me think I am good. Yeah, so the solution to that is anything you do that's good, you think it's because Krishna is empowering me. And anything you do that's wrong, you think, I'm an idiot, basically. That's why I did it wrong. <clears throat> but anything... Or some variety of that. You could be nicer on yourself. Yeah, well, I didn't know what I was doing. I should have learned. Or, yeah, I made a mistake. You know, you can be kinder than calling yourself an idiot, but that was just for dramatic entertainment value. But when you do something great, you think, I was only able to do this by Krishna's mercy, and then you'll never become puffed up because you'll never think it was you. You'll always think, thank you, Krishna. I am not qualified to do this. But you have given me ability, you have given me intelligence. And if you think that way, Christe, you get more. And if you think, I did it because I'm number one, Krishna goes, ha ha, what an idiot you are. And he takes it away. He's like, I'm not going to give you any power. You think it's you. I just gave you $100 and you're going around telling everybody it's my $100. No, it's not your $100, it's mine. And you're telling everybody it's yours? Okay, that's the last hundred dollars you're getting from me. So if Krishna empowers you and you're successful and you think, wow, just see how successful I am, how smart I am, Krishna says, okay, that's it for you. The mercy, the mercy pipe, or just turn that off for you. Until you grow up and, and can handle this stuff, I'll just turn it off. In fact, today, I want to make you do something really stupid. Maybe that'll make you a little humble. You ever done something stupid and seemed like in the next second the whole world knew? Well, that's Krishna's arrangement just to keep you humble. So I, Christe, personally always think that I need empowerment to do my service and I never want to be so stupid to ever think when I get that empowerment that it's me because I know once I think like that, Krishna's going to say, all right, Close the pipes of mercy. Turn off the hose of mercy till this guy becomes a little humble and understands where his power was coming from. So I always want more power from Krishna and I always know that if 
I always see that power as his, and not take credit for it, try to remain humble, he'll give more. And I need more. And I want more so I can do more service. So don't shy away from the service, shy away from the wrong mentality. Don't shy away, this creates a problem, shy away from the mentality that creates a problem. You know, like you have brahmacharis, I don't want to see any women because they just agitate me. <sighs> yeah. Prabhu, maybe, you know, like, you don't have women evaporating Shakti, so they're not just going to disappear because you don't like them. Maybe you might want to, like, change your mentality a little bit so you can, like, see them like mother and be respectful and, you know, everything's just fine, right? So it's similar to that, something like that. Does that make sense? Okay, Marco says, my understanding is that bhakti is always transcendental, even though it's mixed to your desires due to contact with the gunas. Is that so? Apparently not, according to Third Canto. Of course, in one way or another, everything follows the path. No, because everything is, everything depends on your consciousness. You can do bhakti with your body, but your consciousness is the mode of ignorance. So that's not transcendental. You know, okay, you'd say the bhakti is transcendental, I'm not transcendental. The prasadam is transcendental, I'm not. The deities are, the name is, I'm not. You, yeah, you can say it that way. But for all intents and purposes, you're like bringing bhakti down to the, in, into, you're contaminating it with the modes of nature, with your own consciousness. So yeah, you could say simultaneously one and different. One way or the other, everyone follows the path of Krishna, as it says in the Gita, at a certain point. All devotees, from a certain point of view, all are devotees, but only pure devotees who have a unmotivated desire to serve Krishna can be defined as such. It's also true that Krishna sees everyone and loves everyone equally, even though he has a particular affection. For his intimate devotees who always think of him, we could say that difference between Krishna and Kamsa and the pure bhakta is that bhakta always thinks of Krishna favorably. Yeah, that's true. But <clears throat> in answer to your question, devotional service is always transcendental, but you may not be always transcendental, even though you're doing devotional service. You can do it, you can do it affected by mode of ignorance. I am the best devotee. No one's greater than I am. Just see how my kirtans, no one can chant like that. Just see my classes. No one can even come near to the quality of my classes. Yeah, so I'm giving a class, I'm doing kirtan in the mode of ignorance because I think I'm the best devotee. I'm the, you know, I'm the best thing that happened to Iskon uh, next to sweet rice, right? Me and Sweet Rice were the top two best things in ISKCON. Yeah, that's the mode of ignorance. So, <laughs> Hare Krishna. Uh, Nadi says, I feel bad now realizing that whatever I do for Guru and Krishna is horrible because I'm not pure and qualified enough to do it right. I mean, I had thoughts like this, but <laughs> you proved it. We caught you, Nadia. This happened in one of my humility workshops. Someone said the same thing. He goes, now I realize that practically everything I do has some impure motivation. Well, that's good that you realize that after all these, you've been devoted like 20 years. Well, finally, you, after 20 years, you finally realized it. So that's good. Then now you know. So now you can do some work. I had thoughts like this, but now you proved it. And the fact that Guru and Krishna accept it out of their mercy makes me feel so insignificant, so now I feel even more motivated to become better and work on myself. Wow, fantastic, stupendous. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I have to go now and we're going to visit my mother-in-law, our family, and so we are staying till Wednesday and I don't know if Wednesday I'm gonna have to be in a position to give class if there's time. And I may not know till Wednesday at 7.59 and 59 seconds if I can actually do it. So um, all I can say is, as far as Wednesday's class, it's a definite maybe. That's all I can say. 
And as far as Tuesday night's class, Anuradha, why don't you contact me and we can discuss it. That's also a definite maybe. That's all I can say right now. Because I'm not in control of my life when I'm with my family, because we're, uh, I am a servant of my family. You know, I was thinking, one of the one of the greatest paradoxes in ISKCON is that you learn Trinata Pisunichina to be more humble than a blade of grass. Trinata Pisunichina, more tolerant than a tree. Amanina, Amanadena. You not want any respect for oneself and give all respect to others. And then you get married and you throw that shloka out the door and you treat your wife like you're God. And she's a peasant. Isn't it strange? Don't you find it strange? And then you have all these qualities of a Vaishnava, Titikshava, Karunika, Surida, Sarvati, you know, like tolerant, merciful, kind. And the women are thinking, yeah, I want to marry a devotee because they, have, they practice all these qualities. And then they get married. And it's like, wait a minute. What happened? You know? I thought we're supposed to respect everyone. I thought we're supposed to serve everyone. I thought we're supposed to be one. Yeah, 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 but that's not for my wife. I'm like, come on, Prabhu, that's not for my wife. That's for everybody else. Isn't that strange? Don't you find that strange? It's one of the, I think it's the eighth wonder of the world. That the devotees being trained as a brahmacharya to be humble, submissive, this and that. Then he gets married and he's like, okay, Who's in charge here? You know, uh -huh. isn't that funny? No, it's not funny. It's sad. And my joke, if that's not funny enough, my joke is, you know, that verse, third verse of Shishastakam, um, I never read a disclaimer for that verse. That to be more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, ready to offer our respects unto others, give respects and not wanting any for myself. I never read any disclaimer said, that's not for husbands, or that's not for wives. Did you read that disclaimer there, that verse? I didn't see it, did you? No, I don't think it's there. But it seems like so many men, when they get married, they somehow or other think they read that disclaimer, but I haven't been able to find it. I don't think it's there. But somehow they think, no, there's a disclaimer there. I know, I've seen it. There's a disclaimer. I've seen it somewhere. It's got to be there. No, ladies and gentlemen, there is no disclaimer. And that is one of the... I think that definitely is the eighth wonder of the universe. That we're cultivated to be more humble than a blade of grass. Then we get married and it's like... Okay, verse number three, Shishastakam. That's out the door. Grihasta Ashram, I'm in charge. You do what I say. If you don't like it, get out of here. I was listening to this one devotee who was asking a question. It was a class on Grihasa life or something. He was asking a question. Not to me. Uh, Prabhuji, if my wife doesn't listen to me, what to do? Oh, well, definitely throw her outside and lock the door. Of course. You know. What else would you do? You know, that's what every good husband would do, right? I mean, you haven't gone to classes? You don't know? That's what you're supposed so just, you know, my wife doesn't listen to me. Oh, well, it's like, really? You're the, 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 you must be the only one that that happens to. You mean, you mean it happens to other devotees? You mean like the happily married ones, their wives don't listen to them all the time? Yeah, Prabhu, they know how to deal with it. They don't expect it. Really? Really? Do you know that third verse of Shishastaka? Hmm. Yeah, but I didn't think that applies to the hostile life. No, it does. Really? Really? Like my wife's actually a person? And, you know, I'm actually supposed to listen to her? Yeah, Prabhu. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought I was God in the house. No, you're not God anywhere, Prabhu. Sorry to tell you. Isn't that amazing? And it's, you know, you think, okay, you're just having fun. You're just exaggerating. Um, no. I'm not exaggerating. It's quite common. <laughs> it's common. Yeah, so why am I making fun of this? 
because I'll cry. If I don't make fun of it, I'll cry. It's so common. But it's a message to all the men, like, don't be stupid. Like, I know. We're devotees are the most intelligent, but um, devotees are most intelligent, but sometimes that one they miss. <laughs> that one they miss by a long shot. Okay, I have to go. Sorry. Nice to see you all. And um, save the question. Sydney. I think I answered Sydney's question, though, by answering Christie's question. Uh, Sid, Sydney was saying, How do you feel motivated and insignificant? <clears throat> yeah, because the insignificance is not low self esteem, it's humility. So if you don't mix the two, then you're fine. You know, we're like, If I feel insignificant, I'll be so depressed. No, if you feel insignificant, that's called love of Krishna. When I feel insignificant, it's called humility. And humility is a product of love of Krishna. It's a symptom of love. And we're thinking it's a symptom of like psychological dysfunction. That's why. But um, to Sydney, to feel insignificant, that's the goal of Krishna consciousness. To feel lower than a blade of grass. That's the goal. And that's what happens when you get love. Oh, you mean I'm going to feel like a blade of grass when I get love? Yeah, oh, I don't want that. I don't want to feel insignificant. Well, sorry to tell you, when you get prema, that's how you'll feel. Oh, I don't know if I want prema. I have to think about this. No, we just mix it up with material ideas. That's a short answer. You, if that didn't answer it completely, <laughs> you could ask it another time. Hare Krishna. It's funny. Anyway. Okay, so I'm going to go. Thank you all for coming. We will see you when we see you next. Maybe Wednesday, maybe Tuesday night. I can't say for sure yet.